Aloha. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's May the 12th. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and welcome to What Now America. And the today's title is GOP votes to oust number three leader, Liz Cheney. Um, you know, I was thinking about the title of this show, and, and quite frankly, I think it's, it's not the right title. Maybe the title should be uh, Fighting for the Heart and Soul of the Republican Party, because that seems to be where we're at with um, Liz Cheney, the number three uh, House leader, being ousted by her own peers. Now, it's interesting because it wasn't long ago, and she was one of 10 House representatives, GOP representatives, that voted to impeach Donald Trump. And her peers went into a secret meeting and basically about 60% said, we're gonna retain her, 66%. Let's retain her leadership. So really what's happened since then? Uh, last, yesterday on the House floor, and I'm gonna read this quote, Liz Cheney said in front of the House, and before she spoke these words, um, all the GOP members, except for a few, walked out the door. So that would kind of give you an indication either people are running scared or they just didn't want to hear it and feel guilty. But here's what she said. Every one of us who has sworn the oath must, must do to prevent the unraveling of our democracy. This is not about policy. This is not about partisanship. This is about our duty as Americans. Remaining silent and ignoring the lie that emboldens the liar, I will not participate in that. I will not sit back and watch in silence why others lead our party down a path that abandons the, role, the rule of law and joins the former president's crusade to undermine our democracy. Jay, going to you, uh, first I'd like to introduce our guests. Today we have Jay Fidel, we have Gene Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, and Winston Welch. Welcome everyone and thank you for attending What Now America. Hey, Jay, Jay um, given Liz Cheney's speech at the House floor and the recent oust of her position as a leader in the GOP House, where are we? What happened, what happened since the time that she had uh, confidential private support from her peers? Now she doesn't. What happened between that time and today? Things got much worse. You know, you use the word unravel, and I think the country is unraveling because everything is unraveling. Um, you know, the Congress has already unraveled. It's incapable of doing anything. Um, and the Republican Party now is unraveling. Uh, and to some extent, the Democratic Party has a fragmentation as well. And if you think that uh, Liz Cheney is going to be, um, you know, a viable candidate in the 2024 election, forget about it. That's not going to happen. So what we, what we have is what Vladimir Putin loves to see. We have fragmentation. And I suggest to you that uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have fragmentation all over the place, especially around the Republican Party and about voting in 2022, which is only a year and a half away. And uh, this is going to, this fragmentation will be, in my perception, it will be violent. And uh, that's where we're going to have, um, you know, a sort of a violent conflagration, maybe in some places like Georgia, but also in other places around the country. I don't know how we escape this, but I will cede the rest of my time to my brother Gene, and he can tell us how we're gonna escape violence. Well, yeah, Gene, by all means, go ahead and address that. But also in a second part of that, uh, please tell us what, in your opinion, where the GOP is headed. Is, is it gonna be a, a mandatory requirement that you buy into the big lie, whether you know it's, you know it's not true, but you have to buy into it to please uh, Donald Trump. Where is the GOP headed? Is it headed for a split? Uh, is it headed for violence? Your opinion, please. Right. Um, well, let, let me let, let me begin by saying that uh, Jay and I are the product of a uh, mixed marriage. Uh, my father was one of the few Republicans in our election district in Queens, New York. Uh, he, he never had to wait online very long to cast his vote because there, there weren't any Republicans. <laughs> so so I, I take a, a you know, a, I have a sort of funny uh, vantage point on all of this. Republicans were uh, rare <laughs> in our in our community growing up. Uh, 
I think the Republican Party is not going to split. I think what it what's happening is it shrinking uh, into a very hard base. It, it, it it's it's just be, they they're offloading a different a different image. They're offloading people who are not willing to uh, commit all of their uh, values and. <laughs> Their, their lives, their sacred honors, their fortunes to Donald Trump, former President Trump. And what you're going to be left with is a very lean, a very um, cohesive uh, a group of people. It's going to be the hard of the, the hardest of the hard poor. Uh, what else is going to happen? Uh, you know, a new party can arise. I mean, it's not. It's not unprecedented in American history that new parties arise when old parties just become so rot, rotted. Do you think or that's why Liz Cheney has taken the position she has, speaking outright and, and very forcefully against, against the sycophants of Donald Trump? Is she going to be that person that tries to split the party off? Well, Tim, actually, what you're really saying, what you're really asking me, if I can rephrase your question, is you say, Gene, uh, that a new party might arise. Don't you mean one or more new parties might arise? Because I don't believe that Liz Cheney, uh, who has, uh, you know, on a certain level done the right thing here, but maybe on, on a very important level has done the right thing. I don't think she is the person who is going to, uh, you know, attract every free-floating former Republican in American political life. There are a lot of people who are going to say, hey, where, that, <laughs> have a good time, Liz, and we're glad you were off, off uh, uh, former President Trump's bus, but we're not getting on a bus with you because we really don't agree with you. And Liz Cheney, notwithstanding her uh, good deed, let's say civic good deed of yesterday, uh, you know, has, has a record. And her record is really hard right. It's no, she voted not, with Donald it, Trump 93% of the time. That's correct. That's what you get. You know, that's loyalty for you. Uh, ironically, the person who is, uh, I guess, the leading candidate to succeed her as number three in the Republican uh, uh, constellation, Pantheon, uh, voted uh, with Trump less than that. <laughs> so, 78%. You know, 78% right, right, of the time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She's no prize either. But, uh, but my, my point is that I don't think uh, Republicans, former Republicans, non-Trump Republicans, are going to come to attention and fall in behind her. Some will and some won't. I mean, for example, you know, there were people, the whole, um, uh, th there was a rump group uh, that was very effective. They had uh, some fabulous ads, for example, over the last six months or, or a year uh, of uh, ex-Republicans, and they're not going to follow her, uh, I, I believe. Now, who are they going to follow? And, they, and there's a spectrum. There really is a spectrum. And it, where does, what does a Mitt Romney do? What does Governor Baker of Massachusetts do? Uh, Governor Hogan of Maryland? I don't think, uh, well, I don't know about Mitt Romney. I don't, he says he's very conservative. We'll find out. But Baker isn't, and Larry Hogan in Maryland is. So what, where did they go? They're not going to yeah. become Democrats, that's for sure. Well, I guess that Which leads to the whole other. That's a whole other question. What's a Democrat? <laughs> what, yeah. Well, at least the question is, what is a Republican required to do in order to be a Republican these days? One thing. Take the oath. Take the oath. Yep. To Donald Trump or the Constitution. Uh, well, they've all on paper taken the oath to the Constitution, but you know, oath schmoth. Uh, they, what what we're looking for is the, basically the Fuhrer oath. Sorry to say it, but that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Gene. Hey, Stephanie. You know, after January the sixth, for a brief time, twenty four hour period, you had Lindsey Graham, you had Mitch McConnell, Kevin McCarthy, all throwing down the you know the the horrible thing that happened at the Capitol and and rejecting it outright saying it was wrong, and, and Donald Trump was definitely responsible for it. And then, lo and behold, within 48 hours, that had changed. They were back in Donald Trump's um, corral, if you will. How is that now 
transformed itself to the day where Liz Cheney, voting 93% with Donald Trump on everything he, he wanted, following his policies almost to a T, yet she's still ousted. How does this transformation occur? Is it hypnosis? Is it um, peer pressure? It, what, what is it, do you, in your opinion? What, what can transform such an, a, a firm position about how something's wrong and now it's proven fact and nothing's wrong? Well, I think we've discussed before that there may be some mortal threat behind all of this, but the fact that we were deprived today of the secret ballot vote for Liz Cheney leaves us without the, the information we'd like to have, which is uh, of all of these Republicans who is uh, perhaps uh, not bending the knee to our former president. And that would have given us some notion of where um, the, the split was, because it seems that Liz Cheney, in contrast to her peers, is, has considerable uh, courage and maybe the only balls on the hill up there to come straight forward and stay with you know, what it is that is her, her understanding and belief about the circumstances. So let me, let me hit that I, point. Let, let me hit that point for a second. Um, does that courage uh, translate to votes in her reelection in 2022? Well, I think that she's counting on that. That that I, we have the two games going on now. So so um, McCarthy thinks he's on his way to speaker, and he's got all the debris out of the way now, and's got everything under control. Well, how long does that last? So uh, and, and whereas Liz is willing to step out, enormously brave, on top of stating her her conviction and making it clear and giving us a lesson and reminding us of the constitution and democracy. And now she's stepping out on the plank, uh, waiting to see um, how things play out. And her bet is probably on uh, people's good sense and, and the people that she works with who are too, who, who, are, who are too, what is it, uh, too weak to state their case or they're trying to play both sides until it's clear which one's coming out. But, but we know which one is gonna come out because we can't go forward on that lie. So that's what's bothering me a lot. And I think that's what Cheney is, is, is uh, banking on is that we can't build this uh, community um, and this government on a lie. It's well, what's, not- What's it say about 74 million people who that potentially will go along with this lie? Well, eventually, uh, that, that's true. We, ha we have that, but we also know the data is coming in not that way. The data is coming in that 50% are not good with Trump's per performance, and 44% still are. So we've got what it is, 51 and 44, something like that. So I think uh, that may be um, you know, supportive of what Cheney is doing, and maybe that's given her some you know, reason to be optimistic because it's beginning to change. And the and the the news said that McCarthy and those few people at the last caucus we never mentioned that data. That data right. is hot in in the last couple of days. Well, that data says point. specifically that fifteen percent of his un, um, unapproved, you know, non-approval rate was fifteen percent higher than his approval rate, and they kept that from the from the politicians that. You know, they need that information for their own home districts for their reelection. And if they're going to, you know, if they're now being tagged on to someone who's far more unpopular than they were led to believe. Um, what does that say about the leadership of the GOP party to hide this information from them? Right. And, and showing him to be the loser that he is there. There he's a he's a tremendous loser, hasn't won anything. And as this starts to seep through into the the newscasts from our are uh, not CNN and not MSNBC program that is utterly impossible. Um, eventually, they, they'll have to tell the tale. So I think that um, the worm is turning, as we say, I guess, in the, in the literature, because um, the lie will not hold. The US government won't okay. go. All right, thank you. Winston, do you agree with Stephanie that the lie will not hold, that um... <laughs> Wiser minds will see through this and say, it's a lie, it's always been a lie, and, and uh, the emperor's clothes syndrome is over. 
We're done with Donald Trump. Well, uh, that's a good question. And uh, first, sorry, I've got roofers here. So this is the working from home roofing edition. And premier, je voudrais dire bienvenue à nos amis en l'Europe qui regardent le show ici en Hawaii. I agree. For our friends who are watching from Europe, our Think Tech show, we would like to welcome you and also welcome to Gene as our special guest on Tim's show. I think that I would like to hope that our peoples come to their senses and learn the truth about what's going on. I also am um, saddened that that you have to have this, this fealty to uh, Donald Trump in promoting the big lie, especially when they were, when you had these, these same people, you know, the Speaker of the House, Mitch McConnell, going right against it. That said, I think that um, we may look back on this day and just say, that was a really bad day because it forced the Republicans, like Gene was saying, or, or Stephanie, that is, they're going into this ideological purity model of just those folks. I would disagree well, as far as them becoming Democrats. So, and I was suggesting this to Jay that the Democrats extend an open arm to uh, uh, these, let's call them principled Republicans, and say, if you want to caucus with us as an independent, because you're going to be primaried anyway, so you might as well make the most of your last 18 months in office. And you can say, I'm a principled Republican. They're going to have to do some deep uh, dives inside of their own states and see where their people are. But there is a possibility that they will then reach that. I noticed the governor of Arkansas, no stellar friend of a liberal, was supporting uh, Liz Cheney today. And I think there's a lot of other people out there. There's 30% of the party that will go with them. So um, the All other 70% right. gradually it'll erode. But um, I, do, I do recommend that people uh, watch uh, uh, Chris Cuomo. Uh, he had a, a good piece about it said almost the entire GOP walked out before Cheney's speech on CNN yesterday um, and also that they uh, look at the New York Times.com the Trump's GOP plot against Liz Cheney and our democracy um, and finally the one that's uh, Jeff Flake in Washington Post in today's Republican Party there is no greater offense than honesty so these are some things that I've been troubled this week to see this while we've been sort of happy that our society didn't collapse in the last two months we've had a mass tsunami of, of bills in this legislature you have arizona maricopa county republican party counting the ballots first the chain of custody etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's a lot going on in the last couple months while we just breathed a sigh of relief um, on some level but the damage is continuing to be done uh, on gene you have a comment one thing that uh, and I'd be interested in other panelists' uh, reaction to this. Events are going to move uh, outside of uh, outside the Beltway, as a former Washingtonian, I'll say that, uh, in ways that are going to impact dramatically on things inside the Beltway as well as across the country. Specifically, uh, the criminal justice system, which is intact in our country, is functioning. Uh, people are being prosecuted and are going to be prosecuted and sent to jail because of January 6th. And the federal district court in Washington, D.C. is moving as fast as circumstances permit. The Department of Justice under Merrick Garland is on the case. Uh, the, the, that is a functioning, independent, as, as things go, agency of the government. In addition, in New York State, you have the New York Attorney General who is pursuing criminal charges and related matters, tax uh, issues uh, in the state system. And in New York County, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has uh, been working for months and they've been successful ultimately in getting a subpoena enforced. Uh, and, and therefore, I think there are going to be developments that will dramatically affect the um, credibility and clout and standing of uh, former President Trump, and he will be uh, radioactive in ways and for people who do not yet consider him radioactive. So there's, there's going to be change here that will, that will potentially alter the political uh, array. Let me ask you, 
because the fact that he doesn't have social media at his beck and call, um, doesn't that hasn't that already started to happen? And maybe isn't that what's translating into his unfavorable percentage ratings? His percentage ratings are still pretty good. They're better than mine. I mean, you know, for, for a person who who doesn't, uh, I don't I don't tweet except very infrequently. But you know, for a person who's uh, been cut off from important social media, he's still pretty good uh, in that department. So I, yeah, he he'd probably be somewhat stronger. But you know, his people are there. They're there. <laughs> You know, while, okay. while Gene is here, Tim, he's a, a, a foremost um, expert, national expert in military justice. And uh, I, I, I think there's one area we should cover with him while he is here. And that is, where does the military fit in all of this and all this environment we've been talking about? So, <clears throat> for example, you know, Trump tried to try to sidle up to the military during his time in office. He spent money on them. He made it seem like he was their friend, even, even with a uh, bone spur problem. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, um, the military mm, is sort of mostly, largely on the right side of things. If you talk to people in the service, both enlisted and officers, um, there was a, an issue uh, back at the time of the church Remember the Bible at the church and all that about where the military stood? Um, and more recently, just within the last couple of days, uh, there was a letter by some retired military, <clears throat> senior officers, generals and admirals, what have you, um, you know, sidling up to the right side of things and sidling up to Trump. Um, and th that is kind of revealing, maybe it's the top of the iceberg, but in there somewhere is a right leaning military. We don't have the draft um, and it's career military largely. And I think it kind of to the right side and they will play in my, in my scenario of violence, they will play. Um, somebody's got to call in the national guard. Somebody got to call in, you know, who knows who else in the military to quell disturbances if, if they happen. So I, I wonder uh, what Gene's comments would be because he's really close, understands the heartbeat of the military. Uh, and can tell us where exactly do they do they swing and where do they fit? Well, it's been a, a tough period for the military, uh, and uh, uh, you know the, the military has other fish to fry that are kind of uh, more close to home. I mean, there's a whole controversy that's right now coming to a head: what to do about sexual assault in the military, and should we? Uh, uh, modify the military justice system. That's got a lot of people spun up. Uh, that's another show, uh, which we've already done. <laughs> but but in, in terms of the, the cultural aspects and the role of the armed forces in American life, American civic life, uh, probably uh, if you were making a movie about this uh, period, you'd probably have uh, General Mark Milley as the central character. So who's Mark Milley? He, he's an army four-star general who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. An unusual man. Uh, he's a Princeton graduate. Uh, you know, how does that happen? Uh, you know, uh, anyway, there he is. Uh, he, he doesn't present particularly as an intellectual. He's not a, you know, not a, one of the PhD uh, admirals or generals. Uh, but he had a moment of truth uh, where, if the, as Jay referred, there was the photo op outside St. John's Episcopal Church uh, in Washington, the so-called Church of the Presidents, uh, where he was used as a uh, as a photo op backdrop uh, by former President Trump in a way that was appalling, and uh, uh, General Milley uh, wasn't quick enough quite quick enough on the trigger to realize that he was being set up in a horrendously improper way. About 24, maybe 36 hours later, of course, he uh, issued a statement that was polite, but unmistakable, saying, don't ever do that again. And, you know, a, a message to the troops. Now, as far as the, uh, uh, the retired 
uh, admirals and generals. And the ones who signed this letter are basically kind of alta cockers. I mean, these are people who retired as generals 20 years ago. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, quite uh, strange and uh, uh, at, at the far end of things politically. One of them, I, I, I'm not going to mention any names, but but if you if you take the names and run them through your Google uh, search, you'll you'll find out who we're dealing with here. Uh, it's extraordinary that uh, they would uh, weigh in on something like this because they're supposed to be dedicated to the Constitution. Not that they have not that military personnel shouldn't vote. I mean, General George Marshall made it a point of honor that he didn't vote. That that was supposed to be a good thing. I don't think that's a good thing. I want people to have some skin in the game politically, but uh, this is this is these people have the wrong skin in the wrong game, and uh, the danger that they might what they have to say might resonate with people who are on active duty, uh, or are in the reserves, or National Guard. I mean that that is a little. Yeah. Uh, Gene, didn't we have um, didn't we have several? Ex Joint uh, Chiefs of Staff write a letter. Was it back in January of this year uh, after the insurrection, or even before that? Um, a, a, a list of prominent general, generals, recent generals, and Joint Chiefs of Staff. Didn't wasn't there a letter produced? Uh, I, I think there was, but I'm 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 reaching for the uh, the, the, the yeah, me too. That. Yeah, but it was on the up the other you know the opposite uh, spectrum of of not supporting a president blindly. Right, um, right, it was, right. It was a letter basically supporting the rule of law. And so, you know, these letters are important, but you're right, they're, you know, they're, they're awkward. So Jay, what, what do you think about that other previous letter? Um, did that have any impact to Republicans and, and trying to remember the rule of law as they're trying to support the big lie? Apparently not. None of us remember exactly what was said. <clears throat> so okay. I, 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 don't, I, I, don't, I don't think it had as much effect as the one the other day. And I think, you know, it's in play. I think the military is in play. Um, if you talk to an enlisted or officer, you'll find a lot of them are kind of on the right side of things. Um, and they have a certain connection with the base. They come from rural areas, such as the base comes from. And so, I mean, if I were Trump strategizing for, um, you know, what he wants to do in the election or the run up to the election in 2022 or 2024, um, and given the fact that, you know, as we have discussed, you know, the Republican Party will be a hardcore and uh, a lot of people will have left it, but they may not be actively involved. They may not flock to the Democratic Party. Uh, there may be no really dispositive other party. And so uh, query, you know, this will be in play. And if there is violence, <clears throat> they have to call in the military. When that happened on January 6th, it did not work very well at all. Gene, you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just want to, uh, not to divert the, the conversation, but I also, I think it's important to uh, ponder whether we're dealing with something that is more than a, tran a transitory problem. Uh, we, we all know that uh, there are problems with the U.S. Constitution. Everybody, by the way, everybody in sight says, well, I'm supporting the Constitution. You know, <laughs> even, even the people at, uh, at January 6th, they said, well, I'm doing this for the Constitution. Trump's the, uh, Trump was the commander. In I'm doing this for the Constitution. Uh, there are real issues in the 21st century with a Constitution that gives states equal representation in the, in the Senate. I mean, that's a real problem. Uh, and by the way, if you tie the equal representation of the states in the Senate, which is a wild violation of one person, one vote, I mean, that's, that came later, uh, uh, tie that to uh, the filibuster. There's a toxic combination. You get two bad ideas, and they turn into a single really terrible idea. And that a lot of what we're dealing with right now in terms of the paralysis uh, and rot in okay. the American political system is a combination of those two uh, building blocks. Yeah. Stephanie, go ahead. Well, briefly, 
I, I've heard, read, that the founding fathers, and on, on their behalf, they had a massive uh, challenge, and they weren't able to work everything out. And um, I think that uh, what's considered ab about where they couldn't work everything out and get it into the Constitution, those are the problems that we have had for through the centuries and at half and at one point culminating in the Civil War. So that all of this traces right back to the list that the founding fathers are trying to move through and, and bless their hearts, they got through it as much as they could, but they didn't get it all done. Now, how it is that we uh, deal with that, um, I don't know. And I, uh, Constitutional Convention is probably far, far from anything we can see in the near future. But anyway, just to, on behalf of the founding fathers, it was a mighty yeah. effort but they couldn't do it all. And here we are. So now we have the obligation and, to work it out. And a lot of it had to do with race. Let's yes, and right. I think most of it had, of it had to, do, had with to do with race. Well, a lot with states' rights. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. is uh, the issue here? OK, know. we are out of time, but I want to go around the, the table here. Uh, Winston, your last comments about this discussion or things of next week to come. Uh, I've been a little pessimistic this week. I don't like the Republican uh, party of Maricopa County counting the elections, the, the very action of it is, um, it, 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 it just speaks volumes as to what's going to be happening coming up in the future. They've already counted and recounted and hand counted and had cameras. Now they're looking for bamboo fragments. I, it, it's, it's so dumb. It's, it's hard to say anything, but I do feel I've been pessimistic this week, but now after hearing some folks, I'm a little bit optimistic. Jay's been more optimistic. Stephanie sounded optimistic. CNN had a nice article as well, uh, Biden's edge over Trump. And it talks about how popular Joe Biden is and yeah. that this may be a, a, that it may be you have these folks that are going to support Donald Trump. But you also have a lot of them that are saying we like sane people in government. We don't care if he's giving away the, the farm, if he's printing money, whatever it is he's doing or they like that he's doing that. It doesn't matter. We have an adult in office who is uh leading our government and uh, making our nation feel uh, secure and sane again. And I think that that portends well for the future. So I'm gonna leave with that thought, a little bit of optimism on a week of pessimism. We could use it. Thank you, Winston. Jay, your last thoughts. Well, I, I go back to the metronome, as you know, the days tick by and the infrastructure bill is dead. There's no gun control, there's no immigration reform and other things that should happen aren't happening. Congress is, is non-functional. It goes beyond dysfunctional. And what happened with Liz Cheney demonstrates that that's going to continue and maybe get worse. And the country is exposed. It's vulnerable to so many things, including COVID and climate change and, and geopolitical issues and contentions. So I am sorry, Winston, I am not optimistic. Um, but I would say this, that Jean's point, which I really appreciate, uh, and Stephanie's point, she started it, in fact, is the founders, you know, really didn't cover all the ground. And there are issues that really need to be mm, corrected, reformed, what have you. And, and I hope that at some point in the not too distant future, I mean, maybe on a slow news week, although it doesn't ever seem to be a slow news week these days, maybe on a slow news week, we could get together and talk about how we would reform the Constitution. And maybe Jean, who'll be back in Connecticut or Massachusetts, uh, can talk to us again by remote. We can include him in that conversation. I really like that. Great. Jean, what, what are your last thoughts and what do you think is on the horizon? I'm afraid that uh, what we're going to see is an effort to uh, emasculate the, uh, the Biden administration, despite it, mm. his and its popularity. Mm. Uh, at the front end of the administration, uh, former President Trump and his pals uh, sliced off two or three months by uh, screwing around with the transition. So the transition actually happened after Inauguration Day rather than before Inauguration Day. Thanks. Now your term is three months shorter. And I think uh, there's every reason to fear that the uh, administration's of political effectiveness will end in about a year. So he's got to be working right now as if he was elected not for four years, but for one. That's a hell of a thing. And that's the reality that unfortunately I see. Well, that goes to your comment about filibuster reform, because 
that's going to what's going to take. Think nuclear. Yeah, Stephanie. Oh, you get uh, the last. You get the last word. Well, briefly, I am. I I continue to be astounded at at the pres the former president's ability to to postpone and delay and and have no consequences, and and so I appreciate. Jean's points about so many people that are in the process of the, the justice system, but it's taking so long. And he has demonstrated how that kind of delay and postponement it can, can work it out and, and, and leave, leave the um, issues un, un, uh, attended and certainly consequences not experienced. And they, then they get to be so far from where they're needed to be addressed, it, it's meaningless for the general public who can't keep up with these extended uh, timelines. So I, I that I deplore, and that under that erodes <laughs> some of my my optimism in the in the cause that we have to be America. Alrighty. Well, back. I wish we had another hour, another half hour to discuss the future of democracy in the United States and where we're going with our democracy. But we've run out of time. So I'd like to thank Jay Fidel. Gene Fidel, Stephanie Dalton, and Winston Welch. Thank you for joining us on What Now America. Please join us next week, Wednesday at 11 o'clock. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Aloha. <laughs>